praten. Nee, je mag niks meer. Ik wil dit onderbreken en ik wil dat daar die microfoon weggaat. Ja, dat mag ik niet zeggen. Het is een zootje hier. Want ik ben hier namelijk de baas. Dag dames en heren, u kijkt naar Hilversum Best. Dag allemaal, goedenavond, welkom. Uh, ja, terug zou ik bijna willen zeggen. Deze maand staat de koningin van de talkshow centraal in onze serie Moment voor een televisiemonument. Stel nou eens, u bent lid van een andere partij. Hoe zou u dan Den Uil bestrijden? Onmogelijk opgaaf. <laughs> ik ben in... In maart geboren. Je moet even stil zijn, want Sonja is met mij bezig. <lacht> ja, met Sonja? Uh, ja, toch Sonja. Ik ben de vrouw van De vrouw wordt een beetje mild, hè? Volgens ja, hè? Zo ja. mild als de pest, hè? Ja. ja. Sonja Barend. Beroemd door de rachfijne balans tussen de scherpe en de warme vraag... staat deze gehele maand centraal bij Hilversum Best. Hoe gaat het met u? Kut. Ja. We zijn nu maar tegen die mensen als ze weer gezond op moeten. En natuurlijk, haar beroemdste slotuitspraak. En morgen gezond weer op. Nu weer te zien bij Hilversum Best. My dear general. Don't hit! <laughs> Don't hit me! I wear glasses! Both eyes! See, I wear glasses! Don't hit! You are no longer with us. Very nice, all right? So, no, I didn't make it yet! Pardon me, ladies and gentlemen. Please, small stocks. Stop, stop. <laughs> Goedenavond, welkom allemaal bij de Goed Nieuws Show. Een speciale aflevering met vanavond maar één gast. En dat is de grote ambassadeur van UNICEF. De man die 25 jaar lang nu over de hele wereld reist en overal optreedt. En het geld dat hij daarmee verdient weggeeft aan UNICEF. En UNICEF helpt daarmee in 102 landen over de hele wereld... Miljoenen moeders en kinderen. Dames en heren, de allergrootste bedelaar van de wereld, Mr. Danny Kay. Okay. 
Let, let's sing it again. Yeah, hold your hand. Give me a hand. Okay? You, you come on in here. Yeah, just hold a hand. Okay? We sing, do you see that pretty lady yeah. over there? We sing, hello, Sonia, how are you, Sonia? Okay, let's try it. Oh, sheesh. <laughs> hello, Sonia, how are you, Sonia? Okay? <laughs> Sonia. Sonia. How are you? They're singing, they're singing hello, Danny again. <laughs> <laughs> hello, Sonia. Hello, Sonia. Let me hear. Hello, hello Sonia. Sonia. No, 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 not Danny, Sonia. <laughs> hello, Sonia, okay? Hello, Danny. Oh. <laughs> okay, we all go down. Like <laughs> come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Come here. Come here. Ask her in Dutch if she speaks Japanese. Uh, she speaks uh, Japanese and she speaks English. She doesn't speak Dutch. Think. Really? Yeah. You, do you speak Japanese? You do? Do you know any Japanese songs? Huh? Do you know a song called Sho 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 Juji Sho Juji no ni wa wa tsun 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 kyo ta mi narete koi 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 o ira no tomo da cha pum poko no pum. Okay. Uh, you're looking uh, swell. You're looking swell, Sonia. No, you're looking Hello, swell. Hello, Sonia. You're <laughs> so swell, Sonia. You are looking oh so darling here today. I'd like to go, Sonia, and lie down, Sonia, cause I'm sleepy and I haven't had the time to play. Hello. <laughs> Let me all, can you all sing hello, Sonia? Do you all understand English? Yes. yes. Okay. Hello, Sonia. How are you, Sonia? We are very happy that you're here today. Oh, I was saying that. Give me a little introduction. Hello. Well, yes. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I think this will go on New Year's anyway. So. Well, you just came back from the princess, did you? From um, what we call uh, the House of the Dragon. I don't mean the prince, but from the <laughs> Drakenstein. <laughs> yeah. Is this your first television interview? <laughs> <laughs> I 
see, that's the greatest public relations I have ever heard in my whole life, see? A visitor comes to Amsterdam, and the first question is, you just came from the house of the dragon, huh? <laughs> but it's true. What is it called? Uh, the house of the dragon. Drakenstein. What? Drakenstein. Drakenstein. That's right. Yeah. There, there she lives. That's where I came from. Yeah? It was very nice. Yeah? Yeah. The children were there, and one of them is a remarkable young boy. The middle one. What's his name? Peter. I, I don't know. Uh, the, the middle me. one? Does anybody know the middle name of Princess Beatrice's son? Friso. Is Friso? Frito? That's a yeah. corn chip. <laughs> no, I know Alexander, but I... No, 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 the, the middle boy. Friso. F Frito. No, no, not Frito. That's chips. What? <laughs> what is it? Frito is potato chips. Well, what's his name? F Friso. Oh, I see. They told me. I don't know. Yeah. I'm sorry. Anyway, no. he is crazy about playing golf. Mm -hmm. I think he's 10 years old. He has the most natural golf swing you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And he wants more than anything else to be a professional golfer. And when you start at that age, it is absolutely beautiful. He was hitting some balls today at the mm -hmm. Castle of the Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> and he hit one ball and went right in the dragon's nose. <laughs> Who was the dragon there? The dragon was a little monster. They have a, a small little monster that's a friend of the family's, comes in during the day and has something to eat <laughs> and then goes out later. Yeah. You had lunch there? Yeah, we had a very nice lunch. Yeah. We had barbecued chicken mm -hmm. and we had some sausage and we had applesauce and we had... Sa what are you laughing at? <laughs> and we had um, the, the salad and we had, uh, I had a bitter lemon. A bitter lemon? Yes, because I didn't want to drink any wine because I thought because if I came, me. yeah, if I came here and I was terribly nervous, mm -hmm. I would, you know, be knocking things over, so. There you are. Hello, wake up. Danny. <laughs> Danny, do you think everybody knows what UNICEF is? Does everybody know what UNICEF is? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Then I we go so. on talking. Sure. Yeah? Um, why do we work for UNICEF? <laughs> you do it for 25 years now. 25 so maybe you years. don't remember why you did it, why you started it. No, no, no. I yeah. remember very well. Mm. I, I do remember. Mm. When you say, why do you do it? I suppose I could make up the most beautiful story you ever heard in your life. See, I could tell you when I was a very little child and we didn't have any food in the house and you know it was very cold in the winter and I said to myself if ever I become successful I will do everything in my power to see that the children of the world I could make up that whole story it wouldn't be true but I could make that up. No, it, it all started a very long time ago, Sonia. It really did. I, I, I used to work with children on a, on a neighborhood level. And then it grew into a community level. And then it grew into a state level. And then there used to be nationwide events that we used to go to. But it wasn't until Oh, I guess 1953 or four, somewhere around there. I was on a plane coming back from England. And we were about one third across the ocean. And we had a runaway propeller. And we were all going to ditch in the water. And we didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> the propeller, strangely enough, when you have trouble with an engine, you can shut it down, huh? This was a runaway prop, which means that the propeller shaft, they used to have propellers in those days, was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And we didn't know where the propeller was going to go. We are lucky we have the DC-10 now. Yeah. yeah. It's a very good airplane. <laughs> 
it is a very, very good airplane. It could have happened to a 747, it could have happened to a Trident, it could have happened to a DC-8, it could have happened to a 707, really? it can happen to anything. Yeah. yeah. Are you in plane business? No, I'm not <laughs> in the plane. I, I fly airplanes, but uh, yeah, no. Do, no. McDonnell Douglas doesn't yeah. make bad airplanes. You know, it certainly was not a three-inch bolt that made the engine fall off. But it's some, there, there, there are any number of reasons why that, that might have happened. Where was I? You, you were telling, you were Yes, and we were gonna ditch in the ocean, but anyway, no. the, uh, we all got killed. Oh, who are you? I am a fella impersonating Danny Kaye. <laughs> oh yeah, I see. Oh, you're doing quite well, I must say. <laughs> anyway, on that plane was a man called Maurice Pate. And he was the father of UNICEF, really. And some weeks later, he heard that I was going overseas. And he called me up and asked me if I would have lunch with him, and I said, sure. And we went and had lunch, and he said, you know, a lot of people don't know what UNICEF is. They don't know that it means the United Nations Children's Fund. In those days, it was called United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund. And he said, we'd like you to go to some of our installations and look at what, you know, people are doing in different countries and come back and either talk on the radio or write a thing in the magazine. And I said, I'll do better than that. I'll take a camera and a crew and we will film a documentary. And the first one we did was a film called Assignment Children. I hung a microphone around my neck and we shot exactly what we saw. It was, we didn't re stage anything or rehearse anything or whatever. Now, I must confess that when I started with UNICEF, I wasn't familiar with what they were doing either. And it wasn't until I got out in the field, not in the big cities like Bangkok and Rangoon and uh, uh, Calcutta and New Delhi and Bombay, it wasn't there. It was when you got hundreds of miles into the country. And I saw people, many, many people, who were devoting their lives, their energies, their emotions to seeing that these children had some kind of chance in life. And it wasn't until then that I really got hooked on UNICEF. Because after we shot the film and we came back, all of that kept going through my head. And that was the beginning of it 25 years ago. No, no. And uh, yeah. we haven't stopped since. No, but you know, you're kind of married to UNICEF, huh. aren't you? And if you're married for 25 years, you start to know the folds and things. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't want to ask you why you didn't quit working for UNICEF, because um, I think that's no question. But in the meantime, you. Like a marriage, you must think sometimes, oh, I don't want it anymore, or yeah. everything is going wrong. Yeah, we see that. Hmm. But you see it in governments. You see it in countries. You see it in big corporations. Anytime you're dealing with a mass of people, somebody is going to do something wrong. Huh? The basic philosophy of UNICEF has remained constant throughout the years. The fact that in some countries they may not be as efficient as other places is something else again. Sure one gets discouraged and sure one can do better and sure it should, should take less time, but the basic concept still remains and that is that children like this will have a chance to grow up into some kind of maturity. I went to places 25 years ago where they had a little building about uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the size of this, huh? yeah. a little Quonset hut, and they had doctors and medicine. And you go back 20 years later, and you now see a great big complex with four or five enormous buildings with people taking care of hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. So I see the enormous changes that have gone on because I keep going back. 
I see children who were doomed to die. They literally were not going to live, who now have taken their place in their community, in their government. A lot of them, are, one young man is a minister in his government, uh, business people, and they would not have existed if it hadn't been for UNICEF. So. Uh, I, I would like to show a piece of film. Isn't that possible now? Is it not possible to use this thing? No. Uh, Huh? The, oh, there you go. See? Yeah. Now, this, Two minutes. Okay. this is a, yeah. a very effective Western country, huh? Mm -hmm. Holland. Yes. Progressive and everything. Yeah. They can't work the film. <laughs> oh, no. That was the only thing we were rehearsing today. See? <laughs> yeah. There you are. Everything. Yeah. Terrific country, right? Yeah. Now it says, can we see the film? No, because we have the wrong button, which is connected to the DC current, which comes around with the button. Hey, but here it is. And then? Not yet. That's it. That's what happens to UNICEF once in a while. <laughs> Why don't you go and sit down now? Because we're calling a technical expert from Belgium. <laughs> They're on their way in a helicopter, and they'll fix the thing before we're over. <laughs> I want you to meet a friend of mine. He had a long, complicated name, but I called him Sam. Sam had quite a case of yours. Now, I'm not showing you these pictures just to shock you, but take a good look at those sores of Sam's. Even if it is distasteful, you'll be glad you did, really. Because you can't help being glad when you see something good come out of something bad. And Sam was about to give a demonstration of the power of good over evil. But first, there was that pesky business with the needle. Just watch how he takes it. Not a quiver. Good boy, that Sam. What he was getting in that shot was penicillin, the same stuff UNICEF has managed to give to millions of other Sams throughout the world. It was about two weeks later that I stopped back at Sam's place to take a look at the effects of that one shot of penicillin while the whole family looked on. I knew penicillin was supposed to work wonders, but those sores had been pretty frightening, remember? But whoever named it the wonder drug wasn't wrong. It was a small miracle. Those awful sores completely healed over in two short weeks. Later, even the scars would go. Yeah, Sam had a right to be happy. Every kid has a right to be happy. You can help with candy and clowning, but unless the little guy's got a future with a chance in it for him to grow up healthy, candy and clowning are only part-time remedies. It's the big scale, full-time job like UNICEF's that really counts. I'm not in politics, neither is my friend Sam. But nobody likes to see kids hungry or sick, especially when UNICEF's help can keep them healthy like this. I just thought that more people ought to know about UNICEF. And for your kind attention, my friends and I say thank you, thank you, thank you. So that's only one of them. How long ago was that? Um, that is, uh, I think, 24, 23 years yeah. ago. Okay. There's a little sequel to that story. About 10 years after we did this, Maurice Pate said they're having a reunion in Japan and they're bringing a child from each one of the countries that we had visited. And I said, oh, that's a terrific idea. Why don't we try to get little Sam from Thailand? He said, you must be crazy. There were, you know, 30 million cases of this disease in Southeast Asia. And I said, well, all I know is that there were people writing down names and numbers and things, and why don't we try? Let's see if we can find them. And about 10 days later, he called me and said, we found Sam. He was working on his father's farm, I don't know, 50 or 100 miles from Thailand. He was brought to Japan. And I don't know how old Sam was there, seven, I guess, six, yeah, seven. Yeah, six or something. And he was brought there, and he was a beautiful, tall boy in his Thai costume, very dignified. And they said, Sam, this is Danny Kaye. Danny Kaye, this is Sam. 
I couldn't speak any Thai, he couldn't speak any English. And somebody said to him, do you know this man? And he looked at me and he shook his head. Then we showed him the picture. You know where we were having the yeah. candy? They showed him the picture and he looked at the picture and he looked at me and he looked at the picture and he looked at me and he smiled. And it was like the sun was coming out of a big black sky. It was beautiful to watch. From then on, he never left my side. Huh? We went to interviews, we did television shows, we talked to journalists, and he always was at my side. One afternoon, we were talking to a group of people, and he was standing right behind me. And I was telling the story about little Sam, how we had met him, and he had that terrible disease, and we gave him some penicillin, and then with the candy, and he must have sensed that I was talking about him. And all he did, he put his hand on my shoulder. And it was the most eloquent gesture of love that I have ever encountered in my life. Now, all you have to do is multiply that by hundreds of thousands of little Sams who somehow in their mind, consciously or unconsciously, recognize that many people of many nationalities, of many colors, of many faiths, of many cultures have worked together to make his life possible. And when that happens, maybe if we, the adults of the world, understand the problems of the world's children, then maybe the world will be on the way to understanding itself a little better. Because these youngsters, the one who sang today, they're going to inherit the earth. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who long after we're gone are going to be able to hold a hand across a national boundary or an ocean or a language barrier. Mm -hmm. And they may make the world a little bit better place to live in. It may be more it may be a healthier world, it may be a more peaceful world, it may be a happier world. So whatever investment the so-called adults make in the children, they will reap the reward because if they understand, they will know how to go about possibly making this world better. So one thing I must tell you about. Some years ago, youngsters like this didn't know about that. They didn't know about UNICEF. Mm -hmm. They didn't know that there was suffering in the world. And with the advent of television and movies and communication the way we know it now, little children are beginning to look at the television camera, to see youngsters who are starving, to see youngsters who are sick, to see youngsters who have no homes, and they relate to them. They now say, oh, look at that little boy, little girl, the sick, and blah, blah, realizing that they are not as fortunate, those people, as the ones looking. May I ask you a question yes. about that? Because what you said is true, I think, but you know, we see um, this so often on TV, and children do see all the uh, oh. terrible circumstances people live in, but I think that we see it too often and that even children don't know what's real and what's fake and they mix it up. My dear Sonia, I said last night at the concert, parents always think that they can teach their children everything. And sometimes parents are a little bit egotistical. And if parents would just relax and let a child take them some time, they can learn a hell of a lot from the child. Huh? But our culture is that we pass on to children what we have learned. And never stopping for a minute to think that maybe a child can teach some, us something. They are innocent. They have no guile. They 
really don't have to pretend the way adults do. Most children react instinctively and emotionally, and it's usually a true emotion. And all children, in my opinion, behave exactly the same way all over the world, all of them. So whether somebody sees it too much or not, honey, what is the essence of television advertising? Hmm? Use uh, Tapataki soap. It is the best soap that anybody has ever used. Now you hear this 20 times a day. Use Takanaki soap. Now you go into a store and you're looking and suddenly you say, I'll have a cake of that soap, please. Huh? Mm -hmm. And you're buying Takanaki soap. You don't even know that it has been put in your mind. So when you say, are kids looking at this too much or have they seen too much of it? I don't know. Because if it makes an impression in their head, as they grow older, it will be there. They will have recognized that there is a problem somewhere in the world about children of their age. You're doing 25 years, a great deal of good to many, many children. And there has to be something that makes you so fanatic about it. So, Fanatic? Yeah, yeah, I don't know if that's the right word, but... Well, yeah, it'll yeah. do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. I enjoy doing what I do. I get a great sense of reward. I think maybe the best way I can explain this, Sonia, is I, ha I have a daughter called Dina. And when she was very small, as all small children, they want to have their way. Sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't, whatever. Children of famous parents uh, find it very difficult to adjust to realistic life. Huh? Now, I, I am not sure that I want to leave my daughter a legacy of wealth or a legacy of fame or a legacy of easy living. I don't know if I want to do that. And it isn't important. What I would like to leave her is a legacy for her and possibly her children of a happier and more peaceful world. That if I knew that I could hand that over to her in a will instead of, a, well, uh, you will have uh, mommy's necklace and you will have uh, my uh, wristwatch and maybe, maybe come on. If I could, in a will, hand over a legacy of a better world to live in for her and her children, if she ever has any, or their children's children, that I consider a real legacy of inheritance. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why I do it. If I have to search for some psychological reason and if I had to do that, probably that would be the answer. But I, I tell you, to go back and to see young people blossoming where they wouldn't have before, you're not fanatic about it. It's like watching your own child grow up, you know. You sometimes disagree with a child's behavior or you scold him or he doesn't please you or it, the child embarrasses you in front of other people. Well, you don't say, leave the house, you know. I mean, I can't take you out anymore. Yeah. It's in the process of developing. It's in the process of growing that we all have to go through those painful periods. You know, I was reading for this opportunity, The Rights of the Child, mm -hmm. yeah? And um, here somewhere I read, the child shall be brought up in a spirit of understanding, tolerance, friendship among people's peace and universal brotherhood. And I thought, now, wh what do you think? I think you there's one this. word missing in there. You see, in all these rights, I just read them the other day. We, there was a documentary film that was mm. done 
in Italy, and I did the English version. And I don't remember in anywhere of the Declaration of the Rights of a Child, I don't find the word love in here anywhere. It's all very legal and diplomatic language, which I suppose is necessary, I don't know. But the one word that I find that is a true international language is a small word, four letters, L-O-V-E. And children respond to that exactly the same in every country. No. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, you know, the year of the child, huh? Oh, boy, everybody is doing things and, you know, in every state in the country and they're all over and we have committees and the, and the, the society for the and the organization. Oh, boy, the year of the child. See, I feel every year should be the year of the child. I mean, it's, it's no great thing to me. I've been, for 25 years, it's been the year of the child. What I am afraid of is that there has been so much emphasis placed on the year of the child that in 1980, suddenly, people will forget about the year of the child. That the positive aspect is that people become more aware. They do know that there is an organization like UNICEF. They do know that there is a year of the child. And if somebody had not known before, it will bring it to their attention. And then it depends on the thousands of volunteers who give of themselves and their time and their energies to keep it moving year after year after year. So maybe this year, a lot of people who did not know about UNICEF will become aware of UNICEF, who may become volunteers, who may be moved by the fact that there are so many children in the world in such dire need. But is this more than a piece of paper, as in the, in the year of a child, this year, uh, Bokassa himself murders a hundred children, and they're sending lots of Vietnamese children back into the sea? Every the legal the document child. is a piece of paper. There you're right, yeah. Thanks. Now, if you're going to live by documents alone, uh, that's fine. I don't think they work. I think intentions work and attitude works and caring works. Look at the laws. You know, they have laws in every country and laws are being broken day after day after day. And it doesn't do any good to make more laws because people are not living up to the ones that we have today. It is attitude. It is caring about something. Now, what's happening with the children in, in Southeast Asia is horrendous. It's just awful. Have you ever thought of going into poli politics? Like, you know, um, I thought about Jane Fonda, mm -hmm. who's using her fame somewhere in politics. Mm -hmm. And you're working so hard and raise money and, you know, UNICEF is solving problems, that's true. But mm. maybe you better work in politics. Oh, maybe not. I am not a political animal. See, and I don't mean that in the derogatory sense of the word. I mean in the sense of species, like a lion is different from a tiger and a tiger is different from a camel. I am not a political animal. I don't relate to politics. I am interested in politics. But I would rather work with an organization like UNICEF on an international basis, which is relatively free of politics. You see, no matter what your, no matter what your plans are, no matter how lofty your principles and ideals are, the first duty of a politician is what? I 
I asked that of a politician, and he said, well, to present the program to the people. I said, hey, 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 you're a little bit ahead of yourself. The first duty of a politician is to be elected. Huh? Because if you're not elected, you can have the greatest ideas in the world, and you can't present them. And the second duty of a politician is to be re-elected. That's fine, because we live in a political world, and I admire politi politicians. I just don't think of myself in the political arena and in the political form. Also in politics, you are of necessity confined to certain parameters. Huh? As a private citizen, I can want, I'll tell you one great story, okay? I, I am now made, you know, the, the, the ambassador at large with UNICEF and where we travel. And then some years ago, we went to Vienna. And uh, we saw the Minister of Education, the Minister of Justice, and the Minister of Finance, and then the Mayor of Vienna, and the Minister of Samaritan, the Minister of Samaritan. The next day, we're going to meet the President of Austria, okay? And we go into a doorway, hall, anteroom, anteroom, hallway, door, door, anteroom, hallway. And we finally get into a room that is five times this size. Okay? And we're standing in the middle of the room. And somebody says, Mr. Ambassador, the President is coming now. I said, Mr. Ambassador, I turned around to see who we was talking to, and he meant me. <laughs> uh. Now, from Utrecht, comes a man with short, cropped hair, straight, and he limps all the way across the room in the middle of the room. They say, Mr. President, this is Mr. Danny Kay, Ambassador of UNICEF, and he says, well, I am delighted that you are able to come here to our city because we are all very proud of Vienna and we have many things to show you which I think you will like. And I said, well, Mr. President, I, uh, I've read about Vienna for many years, and I've seen it for time, blah, 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 blah. and we talk and talk and talk. Now, he limped all the way across, huh? And I'm shifting my weight from one side to another, another, and finally I say to him, Mr. President, why don't we sit down? So he said, I am supposed to ask you that. <laughs> I said, well, ask me for heaven's sake. <laughs> he said, I take it you would like to make yourself comfortable. <laughs> I said, true. He said, in that case, we better go to my office. <laughs> we go to his office and we sit down. He said, would you like a cigarette? I said, yes, fine. And he says, I know now why you were anxious to meet me. You were curious to meet an old man. And I said, Mr. President, most of that statement is correct. Most of it. I was curious to meet a great man. He said, oh, well, I said, would you like some coffee? <laughs> I said, yes. So the coffee came. I said, may I ask you a question now? He said, certainly. I said, if I hadn't said that I was anxious to meet a great man, would you have offered me coffee? He said, I think so. <laughs> Now, if I had had a diplomatic portfolio and was a member of the State Department, there was no way in the world I could have said to him, Mr. President, why don't we sit down? Because before you go, you get a whole lecture of protocol. Well, I don't know about protocol. I behave the way I feel and the way I think people feel, and it takes away all of that governmental structure. Huh? Well, you have that in politics, too. So I don't relate to that. Yeah. Did he like your shoes? Did he like my shoes? Yeah. Yes, he wanted to know where he could get some. Yeah, really? Yeah. So I told him if he would let me borrow his foot, I would take it back and have some shoes. <laughs> yeah, we see. I like them. You, this Sonia, morning, you had black ones, yes, had you? Sonia, you're a darling woman. You're attractive and intelligent and aware of current events. But? And you say, you say, I like them. 
I do like them. Well, the point is that as adorable as you are, if you didn't like them, it wouldn't make any difference. I would still wear them. <laughs> peculiar about clothes, are you? I am peculiar about clothes? Yeah. Why don't you just stop and just rephrase that sentence and say, you are peculiar, <laughs> which I am. No, no I'm not peculiar I, about clothes. I, th I think your, f your father was a tailor, was he? Yes, he was a tailor and a designer. He yeah. was a very nice man. He influenced my life a great deal. Oh, now, why do you say I'm peculiar about clothes? Maybe it's not the right word, because I thought about your father being a tailor, and you're always dressed like this. Okay. And, yeah. All right. I'll tell you another story. You see, they have a thing in the United States called the best dressed list, you know? The list of the ten best dressed men in the United States, and the list of the ten best dressed women. And I used to be a lunatic about clothes, and I was on that list for about five or six years. Dressed like this or not? No, 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 no. Oh, it was all with the thing, and I used to make the tailor crazy with the little the thing, and the big... Then I discovered these shoes, right? And the first time I put on a pair of those shoes, I was taken off the best dress list. <laughs> and then my priorities changed in life. And I decided that I was going to wear what made me comfortable and happy and whatever society thought about it was of no real importance to me. Okay. So I dress the way, this is the way I dress at home. And since I have been in Holland, there has been such affection and such warmth and such a sense of belonging here that I feel like I'm home. So when I feel like that, I dress exactly like I do at home. <laughs> you always dress like this? Yes. You like it? Oh, I think it's terrific. Oh. <laughs> I think it's adorable. Now, the other day you came, you had jeans on. Yeah. Okay. Now you So you wear... remember me? Yeah. yeah, now you wear a dress because a lot of people are going to see you on television. Oh, no, I often wear jeans. You often wear jeans on the television yes. show? Yes. Really? So I'm not allowed in the States? No, anything Don't... is allowed. Okay. Anything that you allow yourself that gives you a sense of freedom is fine. I mean, it may not be acceptable to other people, but... Uh... I read in one of those papers. I read Which that, paper? Um, in one of the UNICEF papers. Yes. I read that uh, UNICEF is spending $251 million a year on mm -hmm. the third world. And, um, you know, 25 years ago when you started to work for UNICEF, there was nothing like development cooperation. Yeah. And I asked what the Dutch give for development cooperation. And in Holland, they give seven times as much as $251. Mm -hmm. So what I thought was, you're working so hard, is it still necessary? You know, UNICEF is then what we call a drop on a hot plate, and I think you call it a drop in the ocean or something like drop that. Drop in a bucket. A drop in a bucket. Is it still worthwhile? Uh, Not my know? department. <laughs> you ask me about kids, I can talk to you all day about kids, mm -hmm. about the psychology of kids, or how they behave, or how I relate to them. I can talk to you all day. You want to know about facts and figures and numbers and no. percentages? We have some members of the UNICEF committee here no. who will tell you uh, just what they raised this year and in percentage no. uh, uh, per capita, we have it now. In 1973, we had the uh, four million which we're crossing now. Now, of course, you know, it was event because we've had the thing and and it's this year we'll have a six million for a million guilders or about. No, uh, we are third in the countries of the uh, uh, No, I didn't ask you about figures. I asked you another question. About what? About those figures. But I, I don't know I, anything about figures. No, but that, well, that wasn't what I asked you. I asked you if you need... Oh, if you we're have... having our first fight. <laughs> <laughs> See, 
I, I mean, we've had such a good relationship, but you see how any lovely relationship has stormy seas, eh? This is our first fight, and we may get a divorce. Uh, no, no, I, I won't do that so quickly. No, not so quickly. No, I mean, no. we have to learn about each other, even though we have fights. Yeah. Yeah. No, but what I ask you... is if rich countries are giving not enough but such a lot of money and even Holland is giving seven times as much as UNICEF why is, is it able necessary to for me to yeah I am not a fundraiser but you are no I'm not the people who work with UNICEF raise funds I have never been a fundraiser I am a seeder you know what a seeder is no. <clears throat> in the spring. Oh, a cedar, uh, the, the tree. When you take a shovel and you turn up the ground, you turn up the ground, and then you put seeds in the ground, mm -hmm. huh? and eventually it bears fruit. Mm -hmm. I really have never made a direct pitch for money in all the years that I've been with UNICEF. Never. What I, what I basically do is try to bring back information about what is happening with UNICEF and what they are doing for children to try maybe to make people aware of what is happening. However they want to help from then on is entirely up to them. It would be presumptuous on my part to say to them, well, send money to UNICEF. Or people say, how can I help UNICEF? And I say, I don't know. You look deep down inside and you find a way. You want to work in an office and send out Christmas cards? You want to buy a Christmas card? You want to tell somebody about UNICEF? You want to make people aware, however you can best satisfy yourself that you have done something good is very individual. So. If people who are listening to this program, if people who are watching us want to, at Christmas time, buy enormous batches of Christmas cards, that will save a child's life somewhere in the world. Now, you don't have a personal relationship with them, huh? But think of that. You say, uh, uh, how do you do? Good morning. I'd like to have two UNICEF Christmas cards. Huh? Fellow said, uh, bah, and you pay him for whatever it is. And you take these cards and you send them to somebody. Happy Christmas, Merry Christmas, or whatever. And if you stop to think that the simple purchase of a Christmas card will literally save a child's life, <laughs> my God, when you go to bed that night, uh, and you fall asleep, or just before you fall asleep, and you say, I saved a child's life somewhere in Korea, in Indochina, in Vietnam, or wherever. You feel like you've made a contribution to humanity, to life, to living, to loving, to whatever. You've made some kind of contribution. If somebody wants to call UNICEF and say, uh, uh, if you're very busy at Christmas, uh, I would like to be a volunteer. How can you best use my services? I don't know how people want to help. But if they want to, they will find a way. It is a remarkable organization. Otherwise, I couldn't have had this affair for 25 years. No. Even though we've had arguments. <laughs> yes, yes. But, you know, sometimes, do you, you really believe in a better world, do you? I, when oh, I listen to you, I, I think you I, really believe in a better I, I world. I think, yeah. yes, I do, I do believe in a better world. Yeah. You don't I've, feel... I, what? Pardon. What? No. Go ahead. <laughs> you don't feel Sonia, like... Sonia, let's not have an argument in front of all <laughs> these people, So Let's look like we're in love with each other, for heaven's sake, okay, instead. Okay, yeah. yeah. you, you don't feel like Walter Mitty dreaming of a better world. No, I've seen the results of what they have. I've seen the results of many, WHO, hmm. World Health Organization, works very closely with UNICEF. I've seen them practically eradicate malaria 
in a, in a country like Burma, where they had hundreds of thousands of arable acres of land which they couldn't use on account of malaria. And I've seen them wipe that out, and they now grow, I don't know how many million tons of rice, you know, that they ship all over and, you know, satisfy their own needs. Mm. Well, you know, one of the things, one of the priority projects of UNICEF is the slums now. And yeah. there are slums everywhere. And you could say, the more kids you keep alive, the more slums there will be. There will be no end. Hmm. <laughs> Sonia, dear. In India, and this is a, a horrible kid, thing to a say. Kid, I know. A kid just fell down, and he's going to cry. He's going to decide whether he hurt himself. And in about two minutes, if he decides that he hurt himself, he begin to cry. He won't. No, he. No, he decided not. There was a man in India, on a radio show, who said, "Mr. K, oh, it's a very difficult work you are doing." And we realize, of course, that UNICEF is doing a great deal of help around the world. But I would like to ask you a very simple question. <laughs> well, what's the matter? <laughs> he was a Dutchman. <laughs> he said, don't you think it's nature's way? Don't you think it's nature's way of keeping the population very balanced? Because if we have very many children and uh, they are all going to live, it will be very overcrowded. Don't you think it's nature's way or God's way of being able to balance the population? I said, that's a very good philosophy. Why don't you try that when your kids get sick? See, it becomes a very personal thing. It is very easy, Sonia, and many, many people do it and sit back and say, well, the more kids we have, the more slums we will have, okay? The more we eradicate the slums, maybe the better off the children will be. So you don't know whether the chicken or the egg starts first, huh? But if we do nothing, then we are doomed to disaster, huh? The whole world will collapse completely. And it's only by dint of good thinking people or well-meaning people, that this work continues in the face of all kinds of adversity, in the case of all kind of foul-ups, as we just saw with the film. Yeah. We continued and finally it worked. Huh? If, let's take a simple example, if we said, oh, man, it's not working, and, 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 and never mind, cut it out, and we didn't run it at all, you would never have seen the film. That's basically, I think, the attitude that has to be with, if we're trying to make a better world, and if we run into some discouraging elements, if you stop, you're gonna be sure that you don't have a better world. But if you keep working, maybe, maybe, it will get better. Maybe it will become a more unified whole. Maybe it will be a land where people can live happily and peacefully in brotherhood. But by George, if you don't do anything, I, 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 I think, yeah, it's, uh, it's gonna be a terrible world to live in. Now, at the end of this um, program. We're coming to the end now? Yes, we're coming to the end. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, which camera is on? <laughs> Oh, there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that as seriously as we have talked here, Sonia and myself, I want you to know that this argument that we've had <laughs> in full view of millions of people will not affect our relationship, that we are intelligent enough and broad-minded enough and grown up enough to know that individuals can have differences. Now, when we get home, will I give it to her? Boy, I... <laughs> but here, I want you to know that we are lovey-dovey. No, 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 no. No, we don't... We don't. We don't, I, I still I want to show one piece of film, oh. which I, no, no, which I, no, this was not the end, this is 
almost the almost end. Almost the end. This is the road to an Indian refugee camp near Calcutta. A collecting place, if you will, for human misery. And the weather very often matches the mood. Refugee camps are often the last stop on the road to utter despair. You arrive and you are in need. You need food, you need medicine, you need shelter. The white truck is not out of place here for it's a UNICEF truck. One more emergency, one more battle against human misery. And how can anyone imagine anything much more miserable than this? The rain is relentless. The ground is a quagmire. And these pitiful structures, little more than palm leaves strung on bamboo poles, are the only home these refugees now have. This 20th century marvel is no match for the rain and the mud. You have one choice, my friend. You get out and you push. And you think to yourself, ironically, even here there is an audience. And you wonder at the greatness of heart that allows this little child to muster up a smile. At least the baby is alive and clean. I guess we've all seen and even experienced despair in our time, but I've never seen it etched quite so deeply as in these faces. And if you'd care to step or wade outside for a breath of fresh air, here's another look at the surroundings of Salt Lake Camp, a place studiously avoided by the bluebird of happiness. The fact that there is a field hospital here, however crude, is no accident. UNICEF moves quickly in an emergency. If it can't do anything about the weather, and it can't, it can and does furnish money and food and medicine. This child is suffering from malnutrition. And the next time you hear the phrase starving child, you might think of this face. That should tell you more than anything. I'll never forget your face, too, Dan. Well, you see that day after day after day, it's, uh, you have to be inhuman not to be moved. Uh, Should we feel guilty? Huh? Should we feel guilty? No, not at all. But when you say, do I think there's a better world, I certainly hope there is. And if you can improve that in any way, that's making it a better world. Thank you very much. <laughs>